No one cares about your story. They care about their story. And if they can see themselves in your story, then they will care about your story. This man's an author. He's an entrepreneur. He's a fashion designer. He's also an expert in communication, has a brand new book coming out. Erwin McManus. Erwin McManus. Erwin McManus. What's up, man? Our greatest enemy is not taking care of our inner world. The only real limitations that will ever hold us back are within our own mental structures. Storytelling is almost as important as living a story. Wealth, power, success, they're all wonderful outcomes. I don't want to diminish them. They're just terrible intentions. You find a unique way to solve a problem that everyone has, it's going to revolutionize everything. So what are some of the biggest mistakes that content creators make? What does it take to become an all-time communicator? What are the tips for being a better communicator, for reaching more people, for building a stronger brand? Today, this is a very special episode of the Think Media Podcast, and our guest is Erwin McManus. He's a renowned life architect, award-winning author, and artist, over one million books sold, including his recent new book, Mind Shift. Now, I've been a fan of Erwin for years. He's the pastor of Mosaic Church, and I love his pioneering spirit. He's one of the greatest communicators, and we're going to learn a lot of insights that are practical for business owners, content creators, and anybody that wants to get their message message to more people. And so stick around until the end of this episode. Erwin, how are you doing? I'm doing so good, man. I'm so excited to be here with you. Man, I'm so fired up and so grateful for just your impact on the world. But if we start off with like, just like a bite-sized tactical, tactical thing <laughs> to get right to it, communicating mistakes. What are some of the biggest mistakes that communicators make? Maybe they turn on a Zoom call, they start their video, they start their Instagram live stream, their YouTube video. And as an all-time communicator, you probably are like, you could fix this, you could fix that with just a small tweak. What are some of those? I think the first thing is they need to know their first sentence. And I think a lot of times what happens, they start and they ramble around for a few minutes and they try to find their own bearings in the process. Like last week, um, I did a talk and the first thing I said is, you will be defined by your limits the limits you accept and the ones you reject. And so I wanted that opening line, that opening sentence to clarify and in a sense divide and force people to begin to think that through. That opening sentence is everything. Wow, okay, what, how about another one? If someone's making a mistake, you see it, you're like, oh, that that maybe undercut your message. You were delivering a message, but I lost trust there for you or maybe you lost the audience. Yeah, I think it's not tactical. It's more in, in the realm of essence. Mm. I think really, the biggest mistake communicators make is um, getting ahead of themselves, wanting to be known for speaking rather than being known for what they have to say. I think it's really important to be aware of what you actually have to say, because if you go past what you know, you start using cliches, you start mirroring and echoing other people, and the listener can read right through it. And you think you're saying something really profound and compelling, but they've heard it a thousand times before. And so I actually think the most important thing isn't tactical, it's more essential. Mm -hmm. Stay within the realm of your actual learning and expertise and build on that. And then if you feel like you need more to say, go live a bigger life. Mm -hmm. Go gain more experience, gain more knowledge, go through the tough stuff, and then you'll have more to say and you will be more interesting. Then, man, I like you mentioned the word essence. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you pioneered, kind of a proprietary <laughs> framework, something you discovered. I love that. That sounds so epic. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, is the seven dominant communication frequencies. Yes. Nobody else teaches this. No. This is absolutely incredible. Um, what are the seven dominant communication frequencies and why do they matter? Yeah, I have to say, I, I came together with this uh, framework because of something Aaron asked me to do. We have a, a master class called the Art of Communication. And he asked me to do a 15 minute giveaway. And he goes, could you just create something then? You know, we could just give away to the masses. And I spent the weekend just diving deep and I couldn't sleep for three or four days. I was literally in cold sweats. And I just started mapping out these seven frequencies of communication. It was 30, 40 years of studying human communication and just filtering it down to what are the essential frequencies from which not only do we speak, but do we hear? And so I mapped out seven of them. At first I had five and then I had six and then I knew something was missing. And ironically, the frequency I saw last was my own. And I think that's true for all of us. And that's why processes like this are really important. We can identify other people's, but a lot of times we're blind to our own. So here they are. There is the motivator, the challenger, the commander, 
the healer, the professor, the seer, and the maven. And they may not mean anything when you first hear the words, uh, but we um, we see this every day. If you look at Instagram or TikTok, you know, I, I can't believe I'm 65, now I'm on TikTok, you know, it's, this, is, this is what's happened to my life. And uh, what you'll hear so often are people who have a motivator frequency, and they never say anything negative, they never really call you out, they don't really challenge you, but they are always inspiring you. You always feel encouraged by them. You always feel like you you matter and that you have value. And one of the people that I know, um, John Gordon, he's written like 24 books. You know, he he focuses on positive mental, um, you know, structures, and he is a motivator through and through. And that's why he speaks to college teams and pro teams and to all the sports teams, because when he speaks, he's always motivating you. He's trying to infuse belief in yourself and he's trying to bring energy into the room. And then just slightly off a motivator, but very different, it's a challenger. A lot of times when you're listening on Instagram, you listen to someone and they're telling you, you know, you need to do more, you know? And uh, you need to pay the price, you owe you. And the moment you hear that frequency, that's the challenger. That's the person who thinks their job is to wake you up and call you out and slap you around so that you can finally find the courage to live a life that you were created to live. Then you have the commander, which is a little bit different. And, and you can think of quite a few challengers, by the way. Like think like Ben Newman is a challenger if you ever listen to Ben. And David Goggins. Yeah, David Goggins, totally, you know, a challenger. And and hip hop preacher. I don't and uh Eric Thomas, yeah. yeah. Totally a challenger. Then you have the commander. Commander's the person who somehow earns almost instantaneous authority and they tell you what to do. They don't ask you what to do, they don't recommend what to do. Uh, they tell you what to do. My wife, Kim is a commander. I'm married for 40 years to a commander. And my wife doesn't know how to request. She only knows how to command. And I've even told her sometimes when she's going on stage, hey, just ask him to do this. And the moment she gets up there, she goes, everyone do this. <laughs> and, and what's crazy is everyone does it. She has so much inherent authority that the commander frequency just comes up naturally for her. When someone tries to use it that doesn't have it, they can come across like a dictator. Mm. And or that becomes like the shadow frequency. There's also the the healer, the person whose frequency is always focused on your brokenness, always focused on on the pain or the trauma you've gone through. Uh, my, my friend Lewis Howes, complete healer frequency. I, I, I asked him one time, why is your podcast called the what the uh, uh, the summit of greatness? And um, but it's really all about healing. And he goes, no, you're absolutely right. And for him, you'll you'll only achieve your greatness if you deal with your inner wounds, if you deal with your pain, if you find the healing you need. And that frequency uh, is, is this powerful frequency where you don't even understand what's going on, but that person understands you. And they understand your pain and they're almost breaking open all this hidden trauma and you're finding healing in their voice. There's also the professor, the person who believes that all change happens through knowledge. And I, ha I have a, a friend who's supposed to have, I think, the highest IQ in the world, and he's completely like a professor. He believes that everything is data. In fact, he called me one time saying, what do you, what do you mean not everything is data? <laughs> and uh, he was really upset with me because he heard the seven frequencies. Yeah. And he goes, no, every frequency is about data. And I go, no, your, your frequency is about data, and you read every frequency through it. A professor believes that knowledge is power, that the transference of information, the transference of facts, that's actually the frequency that changes the world. And then there's a seer frequency, that visionary, that person that when you're in the room with them, it's not about buying into their vision. That's not the frequency's power. Mm. The power of a seer frequency is you start erasing the boundaries of your own limitations. You start seeing a bigger life for you, a bigger world for you, a bigger future for yourself, and all of a sudden, their vision translates into your inner world and you begin to have a, a bigger vision for your life. And then the seventh frequency is, is the maven. And this is uh, the most rare and maybe the most uh, ineffective <laughs> and, uh, in some ways. Uh, the maven frequency is the person who um, violates your view of reality. They're, they're, you're not even sure what they're saying is right or true, but you're Kind of sure it's offensive, <laughs> and, uh, and but it's not offensive on an interpersonal level. It's offensive in terms of your view of truth, of what's real, of what's right. And a, a maven is usually a person who doesn't think outside of the box. They don't know how to think inside of the box. Mm. And so when they're being asked, you know, what do you do to be inventive or creative? They don't really understand that because they don't see life from the same vantage point. 
And, and I think this frequency is a really important frequency because it informs the other frequencies, but, but doesn't always have as much of an impact as the other frequencies. Man, that's so fascinating. And, and that's the fastest summary I've ever given in my life. That was amazing. You just <laughs> broke through all seven. Question for the listeners yeah. is, what is your frequency? Because is your your primary frequency or your current frequency is kind of like a superpower. Do you want to play to your strength? Do you want to double down on your frequency? Yes, and yes plus. Because this is not based on a fixed mindset. And I think that I, I've studied psychological assessments for probably 40 years. I have a degree in psychology and philosophy, and I started studying abnormal psychology and, and going through every single test and assessment. And the problem is that most people have a view that it's, it's like a fixed structure. And so if you do something like the Myers-Briggs, if you're familiar with it, then you are an ENTP or you are an ISFJ, and that's who you are for all of your life. And, and the same thing like with the strain finder, you have five signature strengths and those strengths are your strengths forever. This is not like that. This is a dynamic um, view of human communication. You have a core frequency. And if you develop your communication um, essence, you can actually have a cluster of frequencies. And the goal here is to be able to access all seven frequencies whenever you need them in life. Because even let's say my number seven is commander. And my people who know me are surprised. Do you mean how they're ranked? How, uh, seven is the lowest for you? Commander is my lowest one. Got it. It's the frequency I will least likely tap into unconsciously. So I have to tap into it consciously. I never move into commander by instinct, out of intuition or out of my essence. But if there's a fire, you better access that commander frequency. And you better step into that inherent authority where everyone listens to you and doesn't question you so they can actually all live. And so there are different times in your life, you need to be able to access all the different frequencies at some level. And so what I try to help people do is find your primary core frequency, and then identify the cluster of two or three that are most accessible to you, that are the natural cluster, and, and then to begin to, to work your way out from there. And so it's also a good question to ask, what frequency does this situation demand? That's right. So perhaps maybe you're not usually data, but if you're gonna prove a point that needs data, then you need to tap into that. That's right. And the, the challenge though is that most people early on in their communication journey aren't nuanced enough or pliable enough to adapt to the audience or to the needs of the audience. And that's why sometimes you, you bring a certain speaker in for a certain need. And you know, if you bring this speaker in for this other need, they're not going to effectively accomplish that. And, you know, I have a bunch of friends and um, I should leave them nameless, but, you know, I was in this room with guys like Ed Milet and John Gordon and all these different guys. And they're all talking about who's the greatest communicator, right? You know, because yeah. they're not competitive at all, right? Yeah. You, know? <laughs> sure. you know, who's the greatest you know, communicator in the world? And, and one of the things, you know, that we began to lay out is maybe it's not who's the best communicator, but who's the right communicator for this moment for this people. If people need penicillin, it doesn't really matter if like your message cures something else. Sure. They need what they need in that moment. High level communicators can read an audience really fast and move toward the frequency that's needed in that moment. Talking about from your vantage point, what frequency is the primary strength of a couple characters people would know? How about Oprah? I think Oprah is a healer. I yeah. think that's her dominant frequency from my observation. Yeah. And that she works from this interesting mix of, of a healer motivator. She wants to inspire people. She wants to elevate people, but she really wants to heal people and connects at a deep level. I think whenever you're in a conversation with Oprah, you're watching therapy happen. Mm -hmm. And and you have all these you know top level celebrities and stars, and all of a sudden they're in a therapeutic session with her. Yeah. And it's not even by what she says, it's by what she asks and how she pulls things out of you. And all of a sudden you're having all these epiphanies about your own need for healing and growth and development. So I would put her in the healer category. What do you think about Dr. Phil? I think Dr. Phil is um, a commander and a professor. Mm. Most high level communicators have a blend of two, uh, but Dr. Phil is definitely a commander. He sees himself as the principal authority and he's right to tell you what to do. Yep. It's sort of like Dave Ramsey. I think Dave Ramsey is a commander. He doesn't give you options for how you should um, manage your money, yeah. he tells you what to do. 
Got you. And and he comes from and he comes from a core authority base. And people do exactly what he says. Yes. That's how you know his frequency works. Because he has people all over the world who he's never seen face to face who follow step by step everything he says because of the inherent power of his commander frequency. How about Donald Trump? <sighs> That's you know, without being political. Yeah. Okay. Um all seven frequencies have shadow frequencies. And so when a person is operating from um, an inherent energy that's pulling things toward themselves rather than toward others, you begin to experience the shadow frequency. And so I, I think that Donald Trump probably is a commander, but what people experience is the shadow frequency, which is a dictator. Mm. And and so when you watch him at his best, you know, because I think he's had great moments. Yeah. Um, you watch a person with clear command. No question about his direction, his authority. He believes that your operational relationship is to do what he tells you. That's how you know he's a commander. Yeah. And then when he's in a shadow frequency, it becomes dictatorial. And he has, a, in a sense, a vendetta and or becomes angry, feels betrayed. Yeah. Because when you have a commander frequency and you're working from the shadow, if someone doesn't do what you tell them, they've betrayed you. Hmm. Rather than thinking, oh, they disagreed with me. Yeah. Can you see the difference? Oh, incredibly yeah. powerful. Yeah. And and it's a deep conversation to improve our skills as communicators to now see, okay, what is our primary frequency? How can we develop all of the frequencies? But now you're introducing this concept of the shadow frequencies. And one of the things I actually heard you mention <laughs> was you were watching the show Succession. Mm -hmm. Now, we also both discovered that we're both fans of the show. Even though we're not allowed to say we are. Even though we're not allowed to say we are. <laughs> Because it's it's obviously, yeah. it's kind of, it's pretty intense show. You could even call it kind of more dark. And that was one of the revelations you had. It, 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 it has a seediness to it. It has a seediness to yeah. it. You you were like, I know all these frequencies, mm -hmm. but why am I not quite seeing them in the show? And then you realized, well, it was the shadow. Yeah. So go a little bit deeper into that. What happened is we have this uh, learning community called The Arena. And so I asked The Arena, give me the shows that you'd like for me to break down. And they all gave me two shows, Friends and Secession. Could you have two polar opposite shows in sure. the whole world? As far as joy, positivity, <laughs> humor, yeah. versus like betrayal, you know, cut your throat to the top. Like, yeah. So I wasn't really interested in doing Friends. Yeah. So I thought, I've watched all of Secession. I am a huge fan. Yeah. And we talk about the show all the time in LA. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna break down the seven frequencies. There are seven or eight major characters. And I, I felt, um, traumatized when I looked at it, I couldn't find a single one of the frequencies. Yeah. And there's nothing like being the person who designed a particular paradigm and then to find it not it's detectable. Missing. It's yeah. missing completely. Yeah. And so I had a panic attack. Is the paradigm <laughs> broken? Yes. Is the question, but. Well, then I had this inner thought. I thought, check the shadows, which had not occurred to me at first. And so the moment I looked at the shadows, all the characters started popping out. And, and I, I wrote some of them down here because, and you know, it, this is really more for fun. This is not scientific in any way, right? Sure. And so I, I put down, okay, Logan, he's the commander, but he, what, all you see is the dictator. Yes. And Kendall, I think Kendall's a seer. He's actually a visionary. But because it's only a shadow, you see the perfectionist who's always crushed because he can, he can never meet up to his own expectations or anyone else's. You have Shiv who's a challenger, but all you see is their shadow, so she's the manipulator. And then you have uh, Roman, who's the motivator. He just wants to make people happy, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and because his shadow is dominant, he's a performer. And then you have Connor, who marries a prostitute, right? That is the, the shadow of a healer, because he it becomes the guru. And he wants to be president of the United States. He wants the whole world to follow him because he believes he's the source of healing for everyone. And that's the, the shadow of the healer. The guru is the shadow of the healer. Yeah, because it's not that I can help you find healing. I am the source of healing. Mm. You need me to be healed. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the nuanced danger, and even in cults. Wow. You have Tom, and Tom, I think, is uh, a professor who then actually is his shadow is he's a micromanager. And, and then you have Greg, and Greg is the one I really struggled with. So he, he's the one is my furthest lead because I think, I think Greg is the maven, and that's why you can't see him.
And but his shadow is, you know, is that uh, he's a pessimist. He's always thinking something bad's going to happen to him, or you know, or or something bad's going to happen. Uh, he's not going to get what he deserves. Or and and but I think Greg was. Um, if there had been another season, I think Greg would be the one who just starts elevating yeah. unexpectedly. Wow. And so what is the encouragement for communicators for the heart development, mind development, to be powerful communicators, to protect and guard from drifting into this ditch of being a manipulator, being a dictator? And we want to improve our content, but of course, this is going to affect everything around us, our relationships, our family, or for those building teams, for uh, church leaders, faith-based leaders, mm -hmm. culture. This can creep into every arena. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that I think I really struggled with is, you know, I, I grew up irreligious. And um, and then when I became a person of faith and became a follower of Jesus, I didn't resonate with the dominant voices that were expressing now a belief I had. And it was really, really difficult for me. And then when you turn on, you know, really just television, you've got manipulator after manipulator after manipulator after guru after guru after performer after performer. And frankly, all I saw were shadow frequencies. Wow. And it really was incredibly disturbing to me. And so I, I think this is really important because unless you decide to become your authentic self, you're always gonna be working from the shadow on stage. And then I think we have to give ourselves a little grace where we go back and forth sometimes because of insecurity and uh, you know because of you know of self doubt so you can be on stage and you're really the motivator and you're trying to encourage everybody you're trying to infuse life and hope and um and people but then suddenly you become really self aware do they like me how's my talk going mm -hmm. <laughs> the moment you're in that self talk on stage now you're moving into your shadow so then you start performing and you want to perform because you want to make sure that the crowd loves you yeah and and you know and so it can be really really um a, a dynamic process of going, okay, I know I have this performer instinct in me. Yes. And what I want to do when I walk on that platform is not care about what people think about me, but what I think about them. Yes. Not whether the audience is going to love me, but whether I'm going to love them. And one of the things I love is we just did this conference of the Arena Live in LA. And right before you walk up on the stage, uh, Aaron and his team put down, um, this matters. So that right before you walk up, you see those two words. And it's really trying to help the speaker move out of themselves mm -hmm. so that they see themselves as a servant to the room. Yep. And that's the key. The way you can know about uh, whether you're moving in, in a shadow or if you're using in a sense that the light of that, of that frequency is, are you focused on serving or are you focused on receiving and benefiting? And, and I think we can all struggle. We can all struggle with that. Man, so powerful. Um, I wanna ask, who are some modern communicators that you think we can learn from in culture and music in media? So if we're just looking to extrapolate tips and then anchoring back in that, everybody listening to this wants to make better content. They want to yeah, reach sure. people more through video, specifically YouTube, but across platforms. What are some of the observations you're seeing in modern communication that are maybe principles we could apply to our day-to-day -day content creation? Well, one, I think we're having a revolution of communication. I, I, what Instagram and TikTok and the development of social media has done is it has heightened the value of the ability to communicate quickly and uh, in, in a really succinct and powerful way. Twitter did that with writing. When you can only have 140 characters, for me, it was like a, a dream come true. I, I love condensing and finding a way to put something really profound in a capsule that explodes. So when everyone's complaining about the words, I'm like, no, this is beautiful. It's a tiny canvas. Have you ever seen the Mona Lisa? It's so small. I, when we, I took my daughter to Louvre because she wanted to see it so badly. When I walked up and I saw how small it was, I'm like, what, did Da Vinci you know, run out of canvas? What's the deal? And I thought Mariah would be so disappointed because she was maybe 10 years old. And she stood there and it was quiet. She never said a word and minutes went by. And finally she said, I could stand her stand here and look at her all day long. And I realized that if you have true genius, you just don't really need that large of a canvas. I think that's the way it should be with language, with words, and with communication. If you really have something to say, then harness the ability to say it in such a way that the fewer the words, the more powerful. 
And that's the thing I would say to most people on social media, most, most people trying to develop their message. If it takes you too long to say it, you don't understand it yet. Storytelling mm -hmm. is crucial to business success. That's a quote from Entrepreneur Magazine. Um, but I hear about storytelling. You're an all-time storyteller. You're, as a communicator at Mosaic Church, you are often telling stories mm -hmm. weekly, right? And tying it into your content. Yet, I feel like it's also kind of a buzzword. There's all kinds of people like, oh, storytelling, storytelling. But you're like, okay, so what does that mean practically? Uh, how do I actually implement that? So why do you think storytelling matters? And how do you actually find and craft stories that we could weave into our content? What are some practical tips? Storytelling is almost as important as living a story. Mm. <laughs> and I think the problem is that we're moving people right to storytelling rather than story living. The reason I can tell a lot of stories is because I live a lot of life. And, I, and I, I remember, oh, probably 15 years ago. I mean, can you imagine being my wife having to listen to me speak for so many decades, right? It's just brutal. And she came up to me one day and she said, you told the same story. And when she said that, she was saying a lot. And I think I got on a plane and I went somewhere and began to experience life again. Because what I heard her say was, you need to live something new, something fresh, something real. And the reason I can tell 10,000 stories is I've lived 10,000 lives. And, and I, I, I think a part of the problem is that if you're having to borrow stories from people, you're also borrowing lives rather than living one. And so in every book I write, I, there might be one or two minor exceptions, but I never write a story unless I've actually encountered that person or had an experience related to it. And that way, every story in my books are not the result of research, they're a result of living. And so I, I, I'm absolutely convinced that storytelling does shape the future. I think 30 years ago, I wrote in my first book that whoever tells the best story shapes the culture. And, and one of the things that would always frustrate me is that the truth trapped in a bad story will never win over a lie told in a great story. And we see that even today when we're dealing with the conflicts in Israel and Palestine, everyone's working to get the stories out. And people don't even look at the facts. They just get captured by a story. And that story for them becomes reality. And that's why stories are so important. The entire of human history is transported by stories and nothing else. It's the stories that we told each other through the Roman Empire and the Egyptian Empire. It's the stories we've told ourselves through Western history and Eastern history. Those stories shape us and they carry us and they define us. And so really what we need to do is first live a great story, then tell that story well. And in that story, the values and principles that you want to pass on will transfer from you to someone else. For the listener who maybe is digging to see what story have I lived, mm -hmm. but as they dig, they discover, well, I did overcome stage four cancer. Mm -hmm. Well, I did, my wife and I were on the verge of divorce, but we made it work and now we've built a strong marriage and we wanna help others do it. But mm -hmm. I was overweight and now I'm fit and I'm energetic. When I think about the creators listening to this, they figured out how to succeed in real estate and now they teach others how to do it. Mm -hmm. A lot of educators, but maybe the block for them is, but how do I package it and tell it? Because some people, when they tell a story, they're like, well, if I'm gonna communicate this thing, I'm gonna need three hours. Where you're like, well, <laughs> should it be three hours in your 12 minute YouTube video? How do I consolidate it? Is there any basic framework when you think about distilling a story and then putting into it a piece of your communication? Yeah, it's a brutal one. And um, and I know I've even gotten negative pushback on this. Okay. And, but I'm gonna say the way I've said it, no one cares about your story. Okay. <laughs> they care about their story. Mm. And if they can see themselves in your story, then, then they will care about your story. But if all they can see is you in your story, they won't care about your story. So the key to crafting a great story is making it profoundly human, where everyone can see themselves in it. So powerful. So you coach pastors, uh, artists, creatives. What are the biggest blockers that hinder them from producing their best work? First of all, I thought it was interesting that you said I coach pastors. I don't get to coach pastors very much. Okay. More <laughs> entrepreneurs, artists, and creatives. Yeah. I going, I try. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, I think actually the greatest hindrance is the fear of other people's opinions. Wow. And if we could just stop living a life of obligation and start living a life of intention, it would change everything.
if we could begin to tell our story from what is true to us without factoring in how will other people feel about it, you're going to tell the most powerful story. And if no one's offended by your story, no one is transformed by your story either. And so sometimes, I, I know for me, back then, I think it was like 30 years ago, somebody came up to me and they said, how do you do it? And I go, do what? And they go, how do you not care about all the negative input you get, all the negative feedback, all the hate? And I go, what made you think I don't care? I care so much. I am so profoundly empathetic. All of those things really hurt me. I just don't let it define me and I don't let it set my course. Just because you don't let them redirect you doesn't mean it doesn't affect you. I felt every one of those stings in my life. Yeah. I just had to decide, do I live for the acceptance of others or do I live out my own uniqueness and sense of intention? Wow, that's so powerful. You know, when I hear you say that, it seems obvious to me, but I, I would imagine listeners would think, why would you get pushback? Why would you get negative <laughs> feedback? Why would you get critics? And go a little bit deeper and unpack that a little bit, how you, as a maven, mm -hmm. have continued to pioneer when maybe you don't feel supported mm -hmm. or when you are not being supported or when, because we all want our messages to be accepted. That's like, seems to be the definition of success, especially if I'm going to monetize views, I'm going to monetize... Um, and so before you're seeing that happen, yeah, process that a little bit for those dealing with negativity themselves or um, that that are convicted on their message, but just feel like it's not resonating or getting the support. To answer that, I, I can't avoid the actual context in which I was in. Right before we came in, Sean, Aaron was saying uh, to me, um, Dad, you are so much more accepted in this business space than you ever were in like the ministry space. Gotcha. Okay. In the business space, <laughs> we, yeah, there's no we're, friction. <laughs> we were literally having this conversation going, yeah. you know, why did you always choose the path of most resistance? And because that would in many ways describe American Christianity. <laughs> and so um, I didn't know, one, you're not necessarily aware that you're a maven. You just think that um, you see the world the way everyone sees the world. It just takes a little while before you realize that no one else sees the world the way you're seeing it right now. And so early on, when I became a person of faith, I was so bored in church. So it, it wasn't like a highly noble motivation. I just didn't want to fall asleep because now I believe in Jesus and I have to go to church. And my wife, man, she's like, you don't miss church. And I, you know, I'm like, you know, I don't want to miss church, but I'm okay if I wanted to go, you know, skiing or something else, right? You know, and and I, I'm still faithful and I still love God and everything like that. But Kim's not like that. Yeah. So I'm in church every Sunday, and I'm falling asleep. I can't even stay awake. And she'd get mad at me. Wake up, wake up! And that's even when I was the speaker. And I said, "Honey, I didn't grow up in church, so I don't have the muscle that can resist boredom." And, and so then when. I started having influence and started deciding that I was supposed to affect the space. I started bringing radical changes that I did not know would have so much resistance. To me, they're obvious things. Architecture either inspires or it, it like swallows up inspiration. It can, architecture can be boring or architecture can be beautiful. So I started working on all the architecture and changing the designs and taking out pews and, and, and realizing Christians end up putting stacked chairs in the exact same line as pews. <laughs> and I go, what is wrong with us? And I started using stand-up comedy and, and drama and film and editing films and using them on Sundays and, um, and you know, just having people painting throughout the building. And all this made people angry. I'm like, how does this make people angry? We're just creating beauty and artistry and wonder. And, uh, and, and yeah, I mean, I did a few things that might have been mildly unorthodox. And, uh, and, and then we became incredibly diverse. And it was a homogenous church. And now it's Asian, Latino, African-American, white. It's like, it just became an incredible blend. People got upset about that. And then people with earrings in their faces started showing up on stage, you know, because I had a band and and uh, and and they got kind of wild and all these people are like all tatted up and everything. And I'd had people telling me, no more people with earrings in their faces on stage. And I'm like, but their heart's awesome. Like, you know, I'd rather have a great heart with lots of earrings in the face than your face without earrings and that level of judgmentalism. And so maybe I didn't always like handle it the right way, but... All these changes brought criticism at every step along the way. Even, by the way, 
You've, you've said Mosaic Church several times because that's what we do whenever we have faith, but it's not called Mosaic Church, it's just Mosaic. I received so much backlash. Are you ashamed of the church? Kind of, but, um, but it wasn't why I took the word church off. It's just Mosaic. Yeah. And the reason I called it just Mosaic is because I didn't want it to feel like it's a place just for Christians. I want it to be a place for anyone who is trying to find meaning in life. And you put church on things because you want Christians to know this is where you belong. I said, no, we're not gonna do that. I don't wear a shirt that says human. I am human and I expect people to figure that out. And we're not gonna put a sign that says church. We're gonna create this beautiful community and let people figure it out. And so there's a lot of things that I did like that that created so much resistance, even the language. For a lot of years, I spoke using the children's Bible. And my wife would say, you're offending people's intelligence. And I said, they need to be offended mm. because they think that Christianity is um, an academic intellectual pursuit and it's a human pursuit. And Jesus spoke to little children. And so if I can't communicate the most important message in the world in a way that a child can get it, I don't think I'm doing it the way Jesus would do it. Wow. So we just made, and then of course, we moved into a nightclub that Prince owned which probably created a lot of crisis. This is decades before this was more popular. Yeah. I mean, every Sunday we would go in there and we'd use double rubber gloves and clean up all the hypodermic needles and all the condoms and move all the mattresses where people were having sex all over the room and fixing commodes that were just overflowing with vomit. And, and this was our Sunday space. Wow. And we would get shut down by the police sometimes because the parties were so wild that they would punish us for the club's activity on Saturday night. And no one thought we should be there. And I thought it was the perfect place for us to be. And we also moved to this club called the Mayan that has like a, a thousand gods carved in there. And of course, all the Christians are like, you can't be in this like sacrilegious space with all these gods in it. I'm going, it's the perfect place for us to be. It's where everyone who doesn't believe in God would go because they're here on Saturday night partying. So when I say come to the Mayan, they go, oh, I know exactly where that was. I was there last night. So we, we just made so many changes and the language. I stopped using religious language and started only using human language. And we did a survey a few years ago on Sunday, Easter Sunday. And we asked, I asked, how many of you are atheists? But you would say, I'm an atheist, but if God's out there, I'd be open. We had over a thousand adults say, I'm an atheist, but if God was out there, I wanna know. And I think that's the difference with Mosaic. And Christians would say, it doesn't feel like church because we're outnumbered. Mm -hmm. And I just love the fact that we were always reinventing, recreating, but it wasn't because I was trying to do something um, offensive. I, I think when you're a maven frequency, you're also trying to figure out how do I reach the other mavens in the world? And I realized there were a lot of people who saw the world the way I did and they're spread across the world, but the conversation about God has never been communicated in their frequency. Wow. And so they were not rejecting God. They were rejecting the frequency that did not communicate to them. And so I understood most people will not resonate with the way I created a community and the way I communicate. But I, that's okay because I really wanted to give my life to the top 5% of innovators and intuitives and pioneers and entrepreneurs and creators. Because if someone doesn't speak on their frequency, they're going to think that God is not speaking to them. There's so many nuggets in there, and I also think it's empowering. It's always inspired. Like courage is transferable. Mm -hmm. I think the spirit of innovation is like it's transferable, and just to see your conviction to go against the grain to do something different—it's one of the freshest things we need as content creators. When everyone's echoing and copying the same things, mm -hmm. how can we pioneer and follow that Maven inspiration? You know, one of the things that you especially have expertise in because you coach high level, the top 5%, as you said. After implementing the right skills, the right tips, the right perseverance, content creators, influencers eventually experience massive success. Mm -hmm. And it's actually wild what's happening in this world ever since Justin Bieber gets discovered on YouTube mm -hmm. um, and, and has insane amounts of fame at such a young age. Now, I would argue that that's more common in the last decade and two decades, of course, than ever before in human history. These mm -hmm. platforms give people of all ages, though, the chance of all of a sudden I was unknown and now I've got fame or I've got money or I've got opportunities. I've got people sliding into my DMs. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Mm -hmm. 
What advice do you have for those that want to be building a life that's built to last once they start experiencing massive success? Mm -hmm. Once now they're are different things coming their way. Stewarding success is crushing a lot of content creators. Mm -hmm. How can we guard against that? I think there's a couple of things I'd like to maybe highlight. One is that um, fame, wealth, power, success, they're all wonderful outcomes. I don't want to diminish them. They're just terrible intentions. Mm. When you make fame your purpose, you will collapse, even if you become famous because you'll never be famous enough because it's an elusive end game. If you make wealth your purpose, you will collapse under the weight of that wealth because wealth is a brutal purpose because you'll never be wealthy enough and you'll always have the fear of not having. But when it's an outcome, it's a wonderful thing. And I, I know so many people who had incredible wealth and they lost it all. And they would say, well, I, I lost my purpose. And well, that's because your purpose was in the outcome. Your purpose should be about becoming. Your purpose should always be rooted in the person you're becoming, not in what you accomplish. And when your purpose is rooted in who you're becoming, whether you succeed or fail, that doesn't touch your purpose. It's just an outcome differential that you can change over time. And then I think the second thing is, it's why I wrote MindShift. Because I, I realized even last night, I was doing this book signing at uh, The Grove and Barnes & Noble in LA. And sometimes you explain something and you see it for the first time. And I realized that I had been in three major phases of my life as a mentor. And the first, I spent it with the urban poor. I worked with gangbangers, drug cartels, people who are incredibly impoverished. And I went, in with a, I went in with a very idealistic view of humanity. I thought, if I could just remove the obstacles that are keeping them trapped in poverty, they're all, they will all just rise up, but I was wrong. There were internal structures of failure in their mental thinking, the mental constructs, their mental mind sh uh, mindsets that actually held them back. And then I thought, okay, that's why the poor are being held back. So if I can change their mental structures, if I can give them a mind shift, I can move them out of poverty. That's 10 years. Then I moved to LA and started working with artists, creatives, you know, the, the most intuitive people in the world, the more, most creative people in the world. And I thought, they're gonna be different. And I, re I realized, oh my gosh, they have the same mental structure issues that the poor had. And even though they're hyper creative and hyper artistic, and no matter how much celebrity they gain, they're still struggling with depression. They're still struggling with a lack of value. They're still struggling with identity issues. They are still struggling with the exact same negative structures that the people trapped in poverty were. That was the next 20 years of my life. And then I started working with people who were from the 100 million to the billions. And I thought, okay, it's gonna be different here. I gotta find a new game plan. Right, you know, I need I need a new skill set for my advising coaching, and it didn't take five minutes before I realized, oh my gosh, this guy has a billion dollars. He has the exact same mental structures as the creative, and the exact same mental structures as the guy who's poor. And if they don't change those mental structures, they're going to be rich and miserable. They're going to have billions and die alone. Mm -hmm. They're not going to have any friendships. They're going to wake up every day with a sense of sadness and depression. And so I wrote Mind Shift because I realized that. Most people have strategies to deal with failure, but very few people have strategies for dealing with success. And while some of us may fall under the weight of failure, most of us who are listening are going to collapse under the weight of success. And we don't plan for success. We think we do, but we don't. We don't sit down and go, what kind of human being do I need to be to carry 100 million? What kind of human being do I need to be to lose 100 million and then get back up? and start all over again, because I have several friends who have done that. What kind of mental structures do I need if I, I had, a, I met with a guy, my first meeting with him, I got an email, would you meet with this guy? And I said, sure, Friday, coffee. I didn't know he lived in New York. He jumped on a plane, came and met me for coffee, had lost $2 billion from his company and 55 million from his personal account, and had a heart attack, got up at 270 pounds, his marriage, was in ruins. And I always get people oftentimes at that stage of the game and was really facing some tremendous issues. And I realized he's struggling with the same need for a mind shift that the gangbanger was dealing with. And that highly successful creative artist who everyone sees as a celebrity was dealing with. Yeah. And, you know, we've become really great friends. It's been a five year journey together. You know, he just settled for $4.2 billion, doesn't have a single 
bit of debt in his entire life, owns like 20 companies. His marriage has been healed. His family's doing fantastic. Wow. But it's not because he figured out how to be a better businessman. It's because he dealt with the internal structures that would lead to, to self-destructive behavior. Yeah. Our greatest enemy is not taking care of our inner world. And that's why the opening page of the book says, the intention of this book is to destroy internal limitations. Because the only real limitations that will ever hold us back are within our own mental structures. Man, it's so powerful. And I can't recommend the book enough as well, Mind Shift. Um, and of course, we'll link all those resources up in the description. And uh, this one is a no-brainer, no pun <laughs> intended, uh, but it doesn't take a genius to think like one. The book is Mind Shift. Uh, I think in the first message at Mosaic, one of the th aspects of Mind Shift is this aspect of innovation. And you talked about innovate innovative thinking like David's choice of a slingshot can lead to breakthrough in life's challenges. Mm -hmm. What about that biblical story speaks to innovation and how can we become better innovators? It does feel like on social media, podcasting, video, there's a lot of just copying and echoing. Mm -hmm. And at some point, or in every case, that might get you moderate success, but that's never gonna change the whole paradigm. Innovation feels like this elusive thing, and I know a major mindset of our community. Everyone's already done it. Um, <laughs> there's so much competition, mm -hmm. and it's overwhelming. There is massive opportunity, but it seems like people are moving fast. And so innovation, again, is kind of like another buzzword. Sounds amazing. How do we actually tap into that practically and begin to innovate as content creators? I rarely think you innovate by trying to solve someone else's problem. <laughs> Mm. you usually innovate when you're trying to solve your own problem <laughs> and, because then you know you've actually solved it. And I think a lot of times we try to pretend we're solving problems by creating products, but they haven't solved them in our life either. I, I can tell you that all the mind shifts in that book solved my problems. I didn't research those. I lived them. And as painful as it is, I thought badly, poorly, wrong at every at a point in my life where I had to make a shift. And I felt the painful transition of it. So we talk about innovation. I think innovation comes from solving real problems. Uh, I, I love the story of David when he fights Goliath. And, and you know, usually it's a story that is there to advocate faith. You need to have faith and trust in God. Uh, but the reality is that the story is so much more than that because, you know, King Saul puts his armor on David and it's too big for David and it's clunky and David's gonna get killed if he goes to fight Goliath the same way everyone has ever fought him. And here's the crazy thing. David wasn't the best warrior. If he was going to take on the same strategy, he wasn't as talented as the guys who were already dead. <laughs> and I think a lot of times we're trying to, you know, you're trying to be whatever, Alex or Moser, you're trying to be Tony Robbins, or you're trying to be, you know, Ed Milad or whoever it is, or Mel Robbins. They're already better than you. <laughs> <laughs> right, they're already better than me. So why would I go to war with their armor on? What David had to do is step back and go, you know, I'm, I'm a kid and I got this giant and all these other guys are already dead. So uh, this is the scenario. I know this approach doesn't work. So I'm not going to try the same approach and believe somehow I can elevate this approach. A lot of people try to be creative doing the same thing. And creativity can optimize a particular strategy. But I have a love-hate relationship with creativity. When I start something new, there is a creative journey to optimizing it, but you get to about 80% and you're using so much energy to get that last 20%. I like cutting out when I'm at about 80% and innovating and finding a new way to get to the next 80% easier. Because I find the zero to 80 is faster than the 80 to 100. Wow. So that's where you need to begin innovating, not when you're failing, but when you're slowing down. So David picks up a slingshot and five smooth stones and only needs one because this innovation was so dynamic that he was able to kill Goliath, throwing a stone, keeping his distance. It solved all the problems. If a giant gets too close, he's going to crush me. <laughs> you know, and uh, and uh, his sword weighs more than my sword. <laughs> you know, I'm, I have a pin and he has a sword. And David kills this giant knocks him out, and after that, everyone knows how to kill a giant. By the way, there's another place in the Bible, this story of David takes a few chapters. Later, there's one verse that says that Goliath's, I think five other brothers were also conquered, but just one verse. Why? Because once you kill a giant, it's not a story after that. Wow. 
And one of the powerful things with innovation is you're not necessarily trying to solve a new problem. You're trying to solve an old problem that no longer can be solved with an old solution. So I don't feel like everyone's already taken up all the space. You find a unique way to solve a problem that everyone has, it's going to revolutionize everything. And, and anyone who thinks all the space has been taken is probably right for them. <laughs> but think about this. There are only 12 notes. Has every song ever been that's ever going to be written has been written? No. Wow. The most common song in the world is I Love You. <laughs> There'll be more songs about I Love You than any other subject that will ever be written about. Why? Because there is so much space if you create and innovate. There are only three primary colors. So why do we have Picassos? Why do we have Monets? Why do, why do we have Da Vinci's? Really, everything that's ever been painted should have already been painted. And yet somebody can take those three primary colors and blend them in a way to create an endless number of color effects. And it's true in everything. They're, they're only like, what, line, circles, and squares. That's it. So really, architecture should have stopped 150 years ago. And yet, architecture is at its pinnacle of design. And yet they're so limited with circles, triangles, and squares. You can either see the limitations as the reason why you don't innovate, or you can see those limitations as the material from which you must innovate. I want to go a little bit deeper. You, you know, talking about David, eventually his son, King Solomon. Mm -hmm. um, here's his fact list. King Solomon, he's revered as one of the wisest and wealthiest men who ever lived. Mm -hmm. Um, he's the son of King David and Bathsheba. He became a king at age 20. Uh, his reign is a time of peace and prosperity for Israel. He's known for wisdom and justice. I figure, I'm guessing, I don't know this ahead of time, but that he's probably one of your favorite characters because he wrote several books, including the Bible, Proverbs, Solomon, Ecclesiastes. But it also talks about how he was a patron of the arts and the sciences. Mm -hmm. It says like he's, he wrote songs, he mm -hmm. did all this different stuff. And then of course he penned um, the book of uh, Proverbs, which is full of wisdom. Mm -hmm. I think a w wisdom is maybe a misunderstood term. I'm mm -hmm. curious, maybe just ranting on this whole subject, when it comes to being an innovator, being a creative, what can we learn from King Solomon? What can we learn from Proverbs? And do you think that people understand what wisdom is? What is wisdom? What really is it? Well, first of all, we can know from Solomon that you can actually live a significant life even if you're a trust fund kid. <laughs> and, uh, good point. He he built, yeah. speaking of succession, yeah. tying it all the way back, that's a good succession. Yeah. And, and while his father was a man of war, he became a man of peace. So he was able to accomplish something his father couldn't accomplish, even though there were things that he could have never accomplished that his father did accomplish. And so I think there's a powerfully synergistic relationship there. And, and I, I think we undervalue the power of legacy, of what we can pass on from generation to generation to generation, which can be incredibly beautiful. And, you know, with Solomon, when, he, when you talk about wisdom, I think at its basic level, like at its most simple level, wisdom is about connecting the dots. And it's about um, understanding cause and effect. And when you look at people who live really like foolish lives, or just make continuously dumb decisions, they have an improper relationship between cause and effect. Mm -hmm. They think, oh, I can, um, I can make this choice and get this outcome. And I, I, you know, I, I remember one time years and years ago when I was working in this inner city project and this you know, 15 year old girl came up to me and to our group and said she was pregnant. And, and her first line was, I don't know how this happened to me. And you know, I said, I think you do. <laughs> the problem is you didn't think that there would be a consequence to a choice that you couldn't control. And I remember one time I was at this event and had this guy, he was like just jacked, really athletic. And I, um, I asked him to come up and do something for me. I said, I just want you to take this ball. I want you to throw it as hard as you can against this wall. And he goes, really? You sure? Because we're inside this building. I said, yeah, just trust me. I'm, I rented it. It's fine. And, uh, and so he takes this thing and everybody's watching him. He was, he was the stud. And he throws this ball as hard as he can against that wall, and it exploded back off that wall, and it hit him right in the face. It was like perfect. And the first thing he said is, why'd you make me do that? And I said, why did I make you do what? He goes, you made me hit myself. I said, well, why didn't you think about where the ball would go after you threw it? 
Did you think it would go through the wall? Why didn't you throw it at an angle? Because he didn't connect effect to cause. So he was in charge of the cause, but I was to blame for the effect. At, the, at its seminal level, wisdom is connecting the dots between cause and effect. But we know life becomes so much more complicated than that. But I've done these surveys around the world and I've interviewed people. The wisest people in the world are rarely the people that have the most wealth in a person's life. And usually the wisest people in the world are rarely the person most educated. You can have wealth and be wise, and you can be educated and be wise, but it's actually more rare than you think. The wisest people that we identify are the ones that have healthy relationships. Somehow they seem to be able to make life work. And I actually think wisdom is deeply connected to the principle of seeing life about people, that the economy of God is relationships. And when you understand that life will be measured by the health of relationships. Look, Solomon made a lot of mistakes. Solomon did a lot of things wrong. But you cannot have peace in the land if you don't have the ability to create relational health. And so you had an entire nation that was at peace because people were not fighting against each other. And one of the most powerful things, you know, and there are other layers. When you go past cause and effect, the next level of wisdom is pattern recognition is when uh, people who are highly wise can identify the effect of patterns. I've seen this before. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times I would counsel people early in my life. And, and I learned early not to tell people what to do. Because one, they don't do it anyway. And two, if they do what you say and it doesn't work, they blame it on you. So I, you know, I'm like, here, these are your options. This is where this choice will take you. This is where this choice will take you. This is where this choice will take you. You have to decide which way you'll go. And I cannot tell you how many people would choose one choice and want a different outcome. They come back 10 years later, 15 years later, and they'd find me and go, it turned out just like you said. How did you know? And I would tell them, well, it's because I'm from the future. And so I came back to warn you. <laughs> but <laughs> because when you have wisdom, you're actually living from the future in the present. When you have wisdom, you do not make choices that cost you your future for something you can gain in the present. When you have wisdom, you sacrifice the present for the future. It's deep. And uh, as we land the plane, I have a powerful question and kind of ending conversation to have, but I want to encourage uh, listeners that, uh, of course, there's so much more we could cover and you want to check out Irwin's books, uh, in particular, Mind Shift. We've linked everything up in the show notes. And of course, there's other um, bonus things down there that you can check out. Um, but as we're speaking to content creators, mm -hmm. um, my friend Kerry Newoff calls this industry knowledge workers. <laughs> and he, took, he calls it that sometimes critics think, oh, what's a content creator really doing? What's an artist really doing? I'm out here, you know, doing hard labor, which is absolutely respectable and truly fatiguing. But many people understand, misunderstand how fatiguing and exhausting knowledge work is. Mm -hmm. Crafting messages, writing books. And it feels like the demand for content creation, for having a great podcast and trying to research your guests and then to come up with original YouTube videos over and over again, and then multiply that by years and multiply that by decades. I've been on YouTube for 16 years doing video for 20 I feel like a real OG in this space. It's about as old, old as you can get. It was two years after the platform started. So um, mm. you have lived not just, you've, you've lived a great story, not just telling a great story, but you've also been very prolific over multiple decades, multiple books. What are the habits and routines and practices for not just getting lucky once? Very common for content creators. Well, I got viral. I don't know how to package that and repeat that. What would you encourage artists, creatives, entrepreneurs for continuing to be prolific? Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. And it's one thing to have one hit song. Yeah. How do you have an actual career of continual hit songs? Well, I do have a talk out there somewhere on serendipity, on how to create continuous serendipitous experiences. Mm. And uh, I was in Costa Rica at this medical center, and I started uh, just sitting down and realizing that I, that so many of the things I write and create are incredibly serendipitous, like they just come to me in an explosion. 
in the or magical or supernatural or whatever language you want to use. Um, but my wife has seen it for 40 years, and my family's seen it. I, uh, I'll walk into a coffee shop and I'll have the whole the whole talk. Uh, I'll, I was driving through Hollywood, and I heard a voice in my head tell me, um, "The warrior is not ready for battle until he has come to know peace." This is the way of the warrior. I heard it in my head, and I told my wife, oh, I know my next book. I know the first line, The Way of the Warrior. And, I, and it was like I heard this Japanese voice, and it was, you know, uh, Ken Watanabe from The you know, Last Samurai. It's like I just had these serendipitous explosions. And, and so I wanted to help people learn how to have those kind of experiences because they're not accidental. They're the result of a continuous practice in my life. And some of it is you... Um, you have to have deep experiences that are constantly challenging you. Those experiences that pull you outside of your comfort zone, experiences that allow you to experience life differently in a new and beautiful way. And, um, you know, Aaron and I had a friend, and he sent us a text. I got reservations for Noma in Copenhagen for dinner. And yin. And it was like three weeks later, or two weeks later, we're in. Like, my wife's like, you're going to dinner. In Copenhagen, I said yes, honey. I'm going to dinner in Copenhagen. While you go to Africa and build a school, yeah. I'm going to go have dinner. And we got on a plane. I flew to London. He was already living in London at the time, and I just move into continuous experiences. And um, and I love the fact that people know around the world that I'm the guy that will jump on a plane and fly to Tokyo or to you know North Korea or wherever it may be, and to have. An, an opportunity to experience something I've never experienced. I think that's one of the reasons I have continuous serendipitous experiences. The other one is imagination. You have to allow your imagination to run wild. Um, you know, I take walks. I, um, you know, I, I spend an hour or two by myself. I turn off my phone and I just dream and imagine. And I press, and I, I don't really tell my imagination where to go. And, and, I, and I've read so many books in my life that have seeded my imagination like Robert Heinlein and Isaac Asinoff, and Andre Norton, all these science fiction writers, they seeded my imagination. And so I just let my imagination go wild and run crazy. And then the other thing you really have to have is, um, is reflection. And when you're going through experiences and you're expanding your imagination and you have the space for reflection, you're able to start connecting the dots between what you've experienced and what you imagine and realize there's something new brewing you know, along the way. And and that's not the whole of it, but I think that's a good place to begin. And I would just say, you know, if you want to, if you want to stay generative and stay creative, um, you you also have to like intersect all that with a deep love for someone or something that you want to help or solve. Because what drives everything inside of me is when someone I care about is hit a wall, or someone I love is drowning, and, and I can't figure out how to help them. And it creates something in me because it generates something deep inside of me where all of a sudden my imagination isn't just a playground. Like I'm searching for a solution that I can't see right now. My experiences are not just self-indulgent. I'm trying to expand my, my, my humanity so that I can ex know something that I could not know before. And when you're doing that, you just become a vessel and, and things do seem to almost transcendently connect to you. I cheat. There's no question in my mind. I cheat. I wrote one of my books, The Barbarian Way, in 10 hours. I downloaded that book so quickly. When I did the seven frequencies, my wife woke up at five in the morning. I was in cold sweats. She goes, are you okay? I said, I can't stop writing. Like I'm hearing this. It's coming so fast. And there's almost like you feel like you're on a a brink of, of, of madness because you're trying to solve a problem that maybe no one else can solve. And that's, that's the thing to me. Don't be focused on yourself. Like ask yourself, you're like, how can I be a vassal to solve a problem, to meet a need? And, and how do I take the full weight of everything I've ever experienced um, to create that? And, and that's for me been the key. I focus on serving people. I take experiences and imagination and reflection and I just let that create the incubator for what will come. And those four elements are extremely poignant for genius content creation. Mm -hmm. And um, you don't have to be able to have the wherewithal to hop on a plane to Copenhagen no. 
I couldn't for decades. For sure. That's my life now. That's your life now. (laughs) Um, But there's something powerful in your yes. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people, especially we're stuck to our screens, Mm -hmm. we're stuck to our home offices. There's a lot of discovery to be had by probably going outside. Can I give a different illustration? Sure. Um, I was in my house, I was going to the store and I I saw this elderly couple in their 90s and they seemed disoriented. They were trying to get on a bus and one of them dropped something and they were having a hard time picking up their bags. So I pulled my car over, incredibly busy traffic and on 3rd and Fairfax. And I jumped out of my car and I helped them pick everything up and I asked them their names. I asked them where they were going because they were trying to catch the bus to get home. And I said, could I drive you home? And I put this elderly couple who were Jewish, who had survived the era of, outside of the Holocaust. And, and I'm driving them to their home, experiencing the beauty and wonder, the suffering and sacrifice and resilience of this, of this couple. I didn't have to go to Copenhagen. Yeah. I drove three minutes from my house and I was having this transcendently beautiful experience. When I dropped them at their house, just to see their gratitude, um, it just overwhelmed me. Yeah. And I don't think I really told people about it at all. It just, it, but it's seared in my memory. And I'm so grateful for that moment. And I gave them my number and they sent me a text later thanking me. And that's happened over and over again. I was at a gas station with my wife. I saw a guy, his credit card wouldn't work. And he was so frustrated and I said, hey, are you okay? And he goes, oh, I just, my credit card won't work and I have to drive, you know, like an hour. And so I filled his car up with gas and, and I um, just said, thank you. And that guy somehow found me and sent me a DM and started thanking me so much and started telling me how his life had been impacted by that. And, and you have serendipitous moments every day of your life. You don't have to fly to Amsterdam. If you can, do. <laughs> if you can, go to Copenhagen, awesome. Yeah. But what I would say is say yes. Like, say yes in life. Yeah. When you see an opportunity, when you see an opening, when you, you know, when you see someone who needs your help, just say yes and watch how your life changes. Man, if we tap into our dominant communication frequency and start powering up all seven, if we guard our heart to protect from the shadow frequencies, mm-hmm. um, but also you have empowered us today to be able to recognize we can better tap into experiences, go outside, Mm -hmm. help somebody, create new experiences. That'll empower our storytelling, Mm -hmm. spark our imagination by reading, by watching, by listening, empower our our reflection. And I love that you talked about love because Mm -hmm. one of our core values at Think Media is that love above all, and we're talking to purpose-driven people Mm -hmm. because, yeah, when we get in our own world and fight for ourselves, man, the work quality goes down. But yeah. when it when we are servant leaders, creating content that solves problems mm-hmm. and thinking about that person we're helping, that person we're entertaining, that person we're impacting, love just infuses everything we're doing in content creation mm-hmm. with a higher level of power, purpose, and impact. I could not agree more. And I mean, so love is the driving principle of the universe. Yeah. Man, so powerful, and you've added so much value today, and i um, grateful for you coming on the podcast. Of course, want to kick it to you. What else can people follow with what you're doing and get engaged with what you're doing? Mind Shift, the book is out now, and so we'll link that up in the show notes, but what else are you up to, and where can people follow you? Well, we have this fantastic um, online mastermind called The Arena, where we focus on communication, leadership, character, and big ideas. And it's um, if, if someone's looking for a way to connect around the world, but they can't fly places and, and they can't afford an in-person mastermind, this is, I think, the, the future of learning. But if you just go to erwinmcmanus.com, you can learn about the arena. You can learn about the, the conference we're doing um, next year already. We just finished the first arena live. We're doing, we already have all of our speakers for next year, yeah. which is pretty amazing. And, and you can learn about the books and everything else we're doing. Erwinmcmanus.com. Think Media Podcast. Uh, Subscribe, like, share. Appreciate you. We'll see you in the next episode.